Across Europe, the landscape is littered with the remnants of a bygone age. An idealised romantic period of chivalry with glorious buildings and mighty kings. Beautiful castles can be found in every country, along rivers, atop mountains and at the heart of medieval cities. But the truth is much more sinister. From the very beginning mankind has waged war against its own kind. Over millennia he has developed weapons to kill more and more people. Running parallel to this, he needed to create methods of self-defence. The castle is the ultimate symbol of that protection for lords, fighters and ordinary folk. It evolved as the weaponry advanced and, amazingly, it is still in use today. From awe-inspiring forts high on hilltops to fantasy castles with moats and mounds, all kinds of styles emerged all over the medieval world to combat all kinds of foe. An amazing tale of innovation formed from the darkest element of the human condition, war. Crenellations, machiolations, hoardings, mots and baileys. What does it all mean? Journey with us across Europe and the Middle East as we discover the history, beauty and power of the castle. Many of our ideas about castles come from the movies because, quite simply, many people have never really visited a castle. We see them through the eyes of Robin Hood and other medieval stories handed down to us and changed throughout the ages. Robin is famous worldwide. The Sheriff of Nottingham holds the castle and Robin has to find various ways of getting inside. Church. This is where Robin and Marion got married. This is the heart of Sherwood Forest. 
This is the heart of that ancient pagan hunting ground. This is the place where in May they would all run off into the woods and come back nine months later <laughs> being with child. So, you know, this is this is the, the place of that much more ancient pagan fertility rite, which Robin is, is you know attached to in May. The May pole dances, the May Day extravagances that went off were all about the union of the, uh, the god and the goddess from ancient times. Fertility rituals. Now it's time to go and see Major Oak, Robin Hood's larder. Much of this is true. The administration was normally held within the castle walls, the home of the noblemen. Robin, as an outcast or representative of the wider community, was on the outside. It's interesting how the legacy, the whole kind of Robin Hood made Marian legacy imbues it itself into the kind of living legend stonework. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's right. Marian didn't even appear in the early Robin Hood texts anyway. Mm -hmm. So how Robin could have married made Marian here. So why do you think it's acquired that legend? Is it a money-making thing? Is it like the pub landlord, a bit like in Glastonbury, thought, oh, I can make a few pennies here? Is there something deeper symbolically at a deeper level? Um, this particular place, and the whole of this area, in fact, Mansfield, Retford, works up all, all of that, is all taken on Robin Hood. Um, I think a lot because they haven't really got anything else. But, <laughs> um, you know, a lot of the tales do actually point to it being Sherwood Forest and uh, Nottingham in particular. So, you know, it is the Sheriff of Nottingham who is his arch adversary. So, um, I think they have a pretty good claim and there are plenty of uh, hooded people in the area from, uh, from the text that we do have. I mean, hood, of course, being some a name synonymous with um, people that uh, would steal on the highways and byways. Across the Middle Ages, castles and fortified structures emerged across Europe and the Middle East. Built by the nobles, there is no strict meaning to the word castle. But in essence, historians agree that it describes a fortified residence for the noble. This separates it from a fortress used to protect ordinary people and from palaces for which nobles were not fortified.
However, all three merge over time and the castle often becomes a refuge for the nobles and ordinary folk alike, and many develop into glorious palaces. The truth is that the word has in fact changed over time. Even Disney now have a castle. When the empire of the Carolingians collapsed, territory across Europe divided, and suddenly nobles were competing with each other. They built castles to protect and control their own area. In the 9th and 10th centuries, castles sprouted up across Europe like mushroom. Not only did these castles provide people with protection from marauding invaders, but also as a base from which to strike out at others. As symbols, the castles informed the world of the power and might of the landowner, and nobles competed with each other. As they did so, innovation erupted and architecture became more and more important. Position was of strategic importance, beside rivers to control commerce, in urban areas to protect people and business. Towns and cities grew stronger and bigger besides castles. Originally, many were built from timber, but quickly became replaced with stone. Where possible, natural defences were utilised, such as hills, rocky outcrops and rivers.
Normally, there would be a central keep, the last line of defence. By the 12th and 13th centuries, towers became popular as architectural advances improved building techniques. This allowed defenders to flank invaders from many sides with arrow fire. Complexity in design saw concentric lines of defence, polygons and circles, defence within defence. Alleyways within the walls were narrowed and winding to allow defenders to trap the enemy. By the 15th century, the introduction of gunpowder meant that castle design had to be rethought. By the 16th century, the castle as we know it declined and replaced by forts of artillery batteries and fortified residences. The word itself comes from the Latin castellum, meaning fortified place. This evolved across Europe into English castel, French chateau and Spanish castillo. Although there is a lot of debate among scholars, they generally accept that it means a private, fortified residence. Arguments emerge because even people from the 11th century defined things differently from our modern historians.
Walled settlements and forts encountered by the Crusaders were called castles by them. In France, the manor house has been called chateau or castle, and yet are not really castles. In fact, this comes from the symbolism of the castle. The idea is it implied might and power. So what are the elements of the castle that help us understand it and define it more? One of the first is what we call the Mott. This refers to a mound with a flat top, upon which is normally a keep of wood or stone. Basically, a walled enclosure on top of a normally man-made hill. Digging out earth to form the mound left a ditch, and it is this ditch which is the real mot or moat. Sometimes filled with water, sometimes not. Technically, the mound or hill is the mot. Often associated with the mot is the bailey. This is simply a fortified enclosure around the area surrounding the mot. The Lord or Noble lived in the Mott, and it was the last line of defence. The Bailey supported buildings for the Lord's household, garrison, workshops, stables and storage. Eventually, the Nobles moved out of the Keep and into more comfortable residences within the Bailey and this meant yet another bailey or enclosure was created to separate the nobles from the ordinary people. More and more structures emerged, such as chapels, administrative centres and hostelries. The castle was forming, changing and growing.
The centre of all this was of course the last line, the keep. This would have been the strongest part of the castle, with the thickest walls. The Great Tower, it was not known as the keep until the 16th century. Instead, it was known as Donjon, and this is where we get the word dungeon, a dark, fortified prison. Initially, the keep formed the residence of the noble, especially in times of high alert. Eventually, though, the nobles built more pleasant mansio, or mansions, within the bailey and close to the keep. The donjon, or keep, then became the headquarters, or barracks for the military. Eventually, another line of defence was added, known as the Curtain Wall. This extra wall enclosed the bailey, and had to be high and thick. In addition to this, they had to be secure from what is known as undermining, weakening of the walls and forcing a collapse. A thick stone skirt was often created to shore up the huge walls. Along the walls they created walkways, battlements, towers and by the 13th century, arrow slits. Of course, there had to be an entrance and so the gatehouse was created. With projecting towers to guard from the blind spot, the gatehouse became a formidable sight to those wishing to enter. The defences included one or more large metal reinforced wooden gates known as portcullis. Arrow slits were included and murder holes above the entranceway. Although many claim these were used to drop boiling oil and lead on the attackers, the truth is nobody really knows, but it is generally believed they dropped heavy objects such as stone and even water to put out fires. In each gatehouse, there were small barracks for the guards. By the 13th and 14th centuries, the gatehouse developed into the Barbican, a simple rampart, ditch and tower in front of the old gatehouse, adding yet further defence. In addition to these basic elements of the castle, they developed a whole host of other imaginative features. The crenellations are the gaps at the top of the wall to allow the defender to hide and fight. Hoardings are pieces of wood that projected from the wall and allowed the defender to drop objects on the attackers.
machiolations were stone projections at the top of the wall with openings to allow objects to be dropped on attackers at the very base of the wall. A sally port was an opening that allowed the defenders to leave the castle and attack. It is the sheer number of castles across 11th and 12th century Europe that has led scholars to say that warfare must have been common and widespread. For instance, in Denmark there is little evidence of castle building until they suffered attacks from the pirates. They started to build coastal defences as a result. Whereas before the pirates had come, they appeared to be relatively peaceful. The fact that castles were built locally by local lords also gives rise to the massive diversity. Different landscapes, different threats. In the UK, castles were built on the Mott and Bailey form up until the 12th century, and yet in Europe, the architecture had already become more sophisticated. Typically, up until the 12th century, the castle would include a keep, gateway and portcullis. Then, in the 13th century, the polygon was introduced with towers at the corners, with arrow slits at each level. If the castle still maintained a keep, it was now also polygon or cylindrical. Gateways were now becoming flanked by two semicircular towers connected by a passageway above the gateway. In the Muslim world, castles also had detached towers around the edges to provide flanking fire and were connected via removable wooden bridges. But why did castles suddenly change? What happened to force these extra and ingenious changes? The answer was believed to lie with the Crusades, a period in history when Christianity decided to take on the world of Islam and hundreds of thousands of Europeans marched into the Middle East for the glory of God. In truth, most were escaping poverty, many were seeking self-glorification and some loved war. The church and nobles were seeking land and power. Architecturally, what happened was simple. The influence of the Byzantines and Saracens. Suddenly, 
Europeans started to understand the power of the arch much more and legends of great Arab architects emerged. One was even said to have visited Wales and aided in the building of their many great castles. There is no real evidence of this. Instead, it is simply a legend to explain the perceived origin of the new architectural ideas. In truth, all over Europe there were still remnants of Roman buildings, which had most of the elements 20th century historians claimed had come solely from the Crusade influence. Castle builders in Europe did not suddenly change as many thought. They slowly learned and developed new ways to meet the changing climate of war. Yes, some influence did come back from the Crusades, but not what had been previously thought. As European architects looked around them, they began to not only learn from the Roman architecture that remained, but they actually started to rebuild and change it, bringing new life in medieval Europe. In fact, many crusaders remained in the Middle East and made their homes there. They started to build in European style and influenced the Muslims. Jerusalem, Antioch, Tripoli and more became homes to grand stone castles with towers, keeps and gatehouses. These mighty castles became a power base of Christianity in the area. These crusader castles were mainly built by groups of noblemen who had joined one of the powerful military orders such as the Knights Templar or Teutonic Knights. They brought with them European architects and masons. This was a subtle change of power. Not the noble lord's residence, but now a stronghold for an elite, holy order of warrior monks. The Crusaders developed a series of concentric rings which would trap the assailants within the walls so they could be fired on from both sides. This concept was brought back to Europe. Edward I of England had been on the Crusades, actually built similar castles in Wales in the 13th century. This is old Clipston in Nottinghamshire in England and this is a, an old castle to King John and it's lost, nobody knows it's here. Everybody drives past, thousands of people drive past every day and it's in the middle of a field and this is all that's left, one more. This dates back to the time, the supposed period. One thing that probably did come from Arabic architecture was the maculation or maculation. 
Before their introduction, the top of the towers had wooden galleries. In Spain, where Islam had taken root, the borders between Christianity and the Muslims saw the rise in castles and the Spanish adopted the separate tower. By the end of the 15th century, they had pushed the Muslims out of the country. For a long period, however, it was the English who led the way in castle building. The French historian Francois Gabelin wrote, The great revival in military architecture was led, as one would naturally expect, by the powerful kings and princes of the time, by the sons of William the Conqueror and their descendants, the Plantagenets, when they became Dukes of Normandy. These were the men who built all the most typical 12th century fortification castles remaining today. By the 15th century, the French were leading the way, but things changed as gunpowder was introduced. In the 14th century, as gunpowder was in its youth, castles were adapted slightly to allow gunfire from the towers with ports. This started to change the shape of castles and new artillery fortifications began to take shape. Bigger and bigger guns were developed and these started to threaten the castle walls from further distances. The response was to build thicker walls and curves to defect the cannonballs. Often bulwarks were built outside of the castle to mount cannon for defence. Overall, it is estimated that between 75,000 and 100,000 castles were built in Western Europe alone. As the castle became less and less important as artillery advanced and modern warfare changed, the castle itself changed. It was adapted into a myriad of uses, manor houses, chateaus, royal residences, administrative centres, town halls, museums and even government buildings. Occasionally, castles were re-fortified, such as in the English Civil War of the 17th century, and even during the two world wars. But the grand day of the castle was over, and replaced with grand country estates and mansions. So how were castles built? The first thing to do was to find a suitable location. Somewhere strategic or dominating. Ideally, there would be a local material available to be quarried. Manpower was generally locally sourced from the unskilled labourers. It is estimated that a standard sized mot would have taken 50 people about 40 days to construct. One particular castle needed 400 masons, 2,000 less skilled workers, 100 carts, 60 wagons, 30 boats, 
200 quarrymen, 30 smiths and carpenters. This was a massive task with massive costs. Add into this the garrison of soldiers, and materials and food. In areas such as Denmark that had few stone quarries, brick was used. Castles were the centres for administration for the lord of the land. Below the lord were the tenants of his land. They in turn had workers and all of them paid taxes. All of this had to be administered, accounted for. The lord had to keep a strong hold over his tenants and show his power through his castle. Above the Lord was the royalty, who expected the Lord to collect taxes on his behalf, to provide soldiers and to keep the land in check. It would often be that two Lords would fight each other and yet be lead to the same monarch. Indeed. Monarchs often owned land in different countries, thus complicating the matter further. The Lord needed a strong and reliable household to carry out the day-to-day -day chores. This was run by a chamberlain. The treasurer administered the written records. While in residence, the castle would have been busy, bustling, and the kitchens worked full time. When away, the castle was quiet and underwent repairs. Because castles were also symbols of power, masons ensured that symbolism worked its way into the building. has been lost over time, but those that have been maintained well were often copied during romantic architectural revivals. A third of the estate was often given as a marriage gift to the Lord's wife. It was her place to administer that property. This helped her to understand the estate better. If the Lord was away, she would be able to run the castle and estate in his name without question from underlings. There are many cases of the lady of the estate 
providing a refined, aristocratic taste to the very building itself. Castles were found near mills and farms for protection and influence. In royal woods and deer parks for protection and upkeep. Beside fish ponds for water and food supply. These kind of castles were generally status symbols with minor defensive means. Most often towns grew up around castles for protection, but sometimes they were even planned that way. As safe havens, castles attracted traders, workmen, artisans and men and women of the cloth. Towns would benefit from most of this, but towns have also been known to die as the castle lost its important role in society and trade went elsewhere. When the Normans invaded England, they actually built castles within existing townships to enforce control. The church ensured that they had their own position within the castle. Firstly, placing a parish church and later cathedrals within or close to the walls of the castle ensured its defence. Secondly, the castle was where all the people were flooding in and out of. It was a perfect catchment area. The church was one of the most important institutions in medieval Europe and the Lord would want it within his sight and sphere of influence. Not only did the Lord have to compete with the Lords, but also with the Church that had influence over the people. Now we turn to the castle as a machine for warfare. In today's age it seems strange to think of the castle as the most important element in war, but that was the truth in its heyday. The weaponry of the castle could reach roughly about 1300 feet around its perimeter. The main offensive point of a castle is the influence of the garrison stationed there. This garrison could ensure that lines of communication between estates were maintained, but they were generally small. Castles didn't need a great number of men to defend them, and they were expensive to keep. The smaller the force needed to defend a castle meant that it could hold out in a siege longer due to needing less supplies.
there are numerous instances of tiny garrisons holding back massive attacks. The general structure of a garrison was simple. A constable was in command, followed by knights, followed by archers and bowmen. There were two ways generally of attacking a castle. Launch an all-out assault or lay a siege. The former would normally mean a great loss of men, but often finish the process much more swiftly. The latter would lose less men, but take longer. The skills on both sides would be crucial, but the castle itself would be the real proof of power. A good castle could survive a siege for years. Most had internal wells for water and various methods of storing, growing and even smuggling in food. However, without some kind of relief from the outside, the castle and its inhabitants would eventually fall. If a full-on attack was decided upon, then numerous methods were employed. For early wooden castles, the obvious choice was fire. Projectile weapons were almost always used and have been for millennia. The trebuchet siege engine was popular and allowed the attacker to project weapons within the walls. Large crossbow siege engines known as ballistas or springolds had evolved from their early days in ancient Greece. These were more accurate than the trebuchet. When gunpowder came along, the cannon replaced them all. The skill of the sapper was also employed. This was a man who would mine beneath the castle wall and erect wooden supports. These would then be burned and the walls would collapse. For this reason, many castles were built on rock or employed wide moats to stop the sappers from digging tunnels. Sometimes a countermine was dug and the battles occurred beneath ground. There are numerous other methods and always a counter weapon was found. In this way, the castle and indeed warfare itself, has evolved, with the side employing the latest technology generally winning.
What we have now in Europe and elsewhere is a remnant of those medieval days with glorious and romantic castles in some wonderful locations. Many have been lost to us, but many remain. And each one has a story to tell. In each place men have battled and died to secure something for their Lord. Thousands of lives have been lived out within these walls. Masons, carpenters, priests and prostitutes. We look back on those times with a strange romantic idea that Errol Flynn is there swashbuckling his way through another silver screen tale. The truth is that lives were hard, short and very rarely free. Castles are, in reality, symbols of an age of warfare and death, of fear and terror. They were built for one purpose, to kill and not to be killed. There is, in truth, nothing romantic about that. <laughs> 